Good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be here and to meet many of you and to be with you all. Uh, it's always great to be in Texas, and I'm very glad to be here. First time in Houston. I'm uh, really enjoying it so far. I've been given the impossible task of speaking about divine simplicity uh, in this lesson. One of the good things is that Dr. Gallagher has uh, brought up a variety of topics that we will trace a little bit farther uh, in this study, and so it's been a, a very useful first lecture for myself. Thank you very much. Uh, I've lost him. Dr. Gallagher, thank you very much for, for, your first, uh, for your first lesson. I say that I've been given an impossible job because, as Dr. Gallagher pointed out, we're dealing with the incomprehensible. And so you tell me, a creature, to use finite words to put infinite concepts into your finite brains. I, I can't do that. That was very rude to ask me to do that. It's impossible. But when we think of it as being impossible or God as being incomprehensible, we need to realize that, yes, God is incomprehensible, but we can still know him truly, though we cannot know him fully. Uh, many people have put it this way, we can apprehend God, though we cannot comprehend God. And they've illustrated it, this is not my illustration, they've illustrated it helpfully by saying, you can put your hand on a tree, but you can't reach your arms around the whole trunk, can you? And so you can know God truly, though we do not know him fully, and we will never, nor can we know him fully, because we are creatures and he is creator. And so we have to sort of adjust our expectations and adjust our We'll adjust our expectations according to our limitations and be content with that. There's nothing wrong with being a creature. Uh, knowing God truly, what more could we want? Uh, to know God and to know his son is eternal life. And so if our expectations are realistic, if our expectations match who we are as creatures, then we can stop stressing about the doctrine of God and we can worship God in light of what he has said to us and the ways in which he has revealed himself to us. I like to quote James Dolezal, who likes to quote Herman Bavinck, who said, we do not agonize over the mystery, we adore the mystery. And here also, as we study divine simplicity, it will be the same, because we will quickly discover that simplicity is not very simple uh, in many ways, and yet it is a wonderful, wonderful doctrine, which I am looking forward to teaching. Now, I want to work through this in three main points the classic message, the three-pointer. Everyone knows the three-pointer. Three main points, and the first of those three main points will be the names of God. We're going to begin with the names of God, and then we'll move on from there in our points. And we're not going to go through every name that is ever used to be associated with God in the scriptures, because that would be far too many, and many of them are simply uh, metaphors. God is, is like unto this. He is called uh, this or that and the other thing, but rather 10 names that are used to specify God himself, ways in which he reveals himself and his people speak of him. And we're going to look at these 10 names very briefly, focusing on the first three names. As I give you, if you follow this, we're going to go three names, three names, three names, one name. So three, 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 one, that's 10. The first three are our, are our focus. So consider then, under the heading of the names of God, the first triad, the first three, which are all names that deal with being. And as Dr. Gallagher has pointed out, the name of God in Exodus 3.14, I am that I am, is one of these. But in addition to the name, I am that I am, there is also the name Jehovah, as well as the name Yah, which is a shortening of the word Jehovah. And so Jehovah, Yah, and I am that I am, all three of these names regular, well, the I am that I am name is not used as commonly, but these names that are regularly used throughout the Old Testament are important. Why are these names important? Because these are the names by which God has chosen to communicate himself to us, to reveal himself, to make himself known to us, is God going to pick just any name? Should we say, well, we have names and they don't mean anything. God picked names for himself. What's the big deal? No, don't you think that God would intentionally reveal himself in certain ways to communicate something about him? We hear in the scriptures about Nabal, as his name is, so is he. Well, although it's a poor analogy, in God's case, we can say, as his name is, so is he. 
And so why is it that he reveals himself and he reveals his names as names that derive from the, the word to be? God is telling us something about his being as he tells us his names. Jehovah, Yah, and I am that I am are all names that come from or use the word to be in Hebrew. And so we're accustomed to hearing those names, Yahweh or Jehovah. We hear them all the time, or, or Yah. They're in our Bibles often untranslated. It's just the name. It's the Hebrew word put into English letters. We hear it all the time, and we don't often recognize or appreciate what is being said to us or what we are saying when those names are being used. Jehovah, Yah, I am that I am, are wonderful names that tell us about the being of God. Now, we'll go into more detail about this and come back to that. I'm simply pointing out at the outset that as God reveals himself through his names, his names deal with being. The second set of three, and the rest I'm just going to list for you, so without going into detail, the next set of three deal with power. And these names are El, which means God, Eloah, which also means God, and Elohim, which we, are com we often hear, which in implies a plurality in the singular God. So El, Eloah, and Elohim are the third set of three names by which God reveals himself, and they deal with power. I am the God. I am God. The next three relate to government, God's rule, his His. I was about to say kingliness, but that's not the best word. That's not the right word. We'll just stick with government and rule. Adonai, which is usually translated Lord in our English Bibles. Shaddai, which is often translated God Almighty. And then the Lord of hosts. All three of those words deal with God's government and authority over all creation. And the tenth name, the last name, is Elyon, which is usually translated the Most High. And so that's a name dealing with exaltation. So when we look at the ten names of God, we see that he reveals things to us about his being, things about his power, things about his government, things about his exaltation. And the New Testament tends to stick to just two common words, God and Lord. Now, what does all of this gathering of information and dumping it on the congregation, what does this have to do with what we are discussing this evening? Well, the names of God reveal to us a supreme being. A supreme being. Who else would take to themselves such names unless they are a supreme being? Who says, I am that I am? And what are we to take from the names of God? What are we to gather from the ways in which God has revealed himself in these names? Well, we find that based on God's self-revelation of I am that I am, that he is pure being. He is pure, perfect being. That is the way in which he has revealed himself. I am that I am. Now we're going to see this conclusion or this interpretation reinforced by other passages of Scripture, which we will turn, return to. But think about this passage in Romans 11, 36, Romans eleven, thirty six, which says, For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. Now, think about the names of God that reveal his being, his power, his authority, his exaltation. And think about the one through whom, from whom, and to who, from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. That verse in Romans fits perfectly with the names of God, that he is the one who exists in and of himself, who exists purely, and who has created all things and has dominion over all things. Only that being can say, I am that I am, for as his name is, so is he. All things are from I am that I am. All things are through I am that I am. All things are to I am that I am. And so what we are currently doing, what I'm trying to lead you through is 
beginning to develop and form our conception, our idea of who God is based on how he has revealed himself in his names in the scriptures. And we have seen that he is a supreme and perfect being. And now we turn to our second main point, which is the simplicity of God, the simplicity of God. And as we discuss the simplicity of God, we will see that it is the doctrine of divine simplicity that protects the supremacy and the perfection of the being of God in the way, in a way that matches the names of God. Simplicity protects the supremacy of God and the perfection of God's being in a way that matches the names of God. Simplicity. God is simple. Which is to say, not a statement about intelligence, but rather a statement about God's being. God's being is simple as opposed to complex or composite. It is simple as opposed to being put together from multiple things. God is simply God, and God is God simply. Now, why? Why is simplicity the explanation for the perfect being, or the per- perfection of God's being, excuse me? And under this point, I want to offer you five reasons. I would inc- strongly encourage you, if you're a note-taker, or to become a note-taker right now, to walk the aisle of note-taking, and to to write down these five arguments for why it is that divine simplicity protects the perfection and supremacy of God's being in light of his names. Number one, composition implies causation. Composition implies causation. And then semicolon, simplicity implies aseity. Simplicity implies aseity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. Aseity, which I'll explain this in just a moment, but I'll repeat it for the people I've asked to take notes. Composition implies causation. Simplicity implies aseity. For God to be God as he has revealed himself truly, And in order for God's names to be true, in order for those names to actually mean what they say, in order for his being and his power and his government and his exaltation to be actual, in order for them to be real and not just names that God has taken unto himself, he must be uncaused. Uncaused. There must not be any prior cause that causes or caused God to be. Rather, God must be ase, of himself, ase. That's where aseity, God's of himselfness. God must be of himself in order that all things might be from him and through him and to him. To God be glory forever. Amen. If God is caused... If there is a prior cause to God, that would be God, from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. Amen. And so God must be of himself. He must be ase, okay? In order for God to be ase, of himself, he must be simple. Why? Because anything that is made up of two pieces has been caused to be put together. Composition, putting two things together, implies causation. All things composed have a composer. And so whenever you put two things together, you have caused their composition. They're being put together. All things composed, therefore, have a causer. They have a cause. And if God is caused... If there is some explanation for God's existence other than God himself existing, then that cause is God. That cause is God. And the being we know as God is deceiving us and lying to us and should not take on the name I am that I am. 
And so that is why we say that composition implies causation. Two things put together have a cause. All things composed have a composer. Whereas simplicity, to be pure, to be composed of no more simple parts, just to be, simplicity implies aseity. So in order for God to be God, he must be simple. He must be of himself, ase. And so simplicity is the explanation for God's name, I am that I am. I exist by virtue of myself. I am pure and perfect being. That name cannot be true apart from divine simplicity. But as his name is, so is he. I am that I am is not put together, is not caused, but rather is of himself. God's existence is of himself. Well, the second argument for why divine simplicity guards the names of God and, and proves that they are true, helps to reinforce that they are true, the second is this. Composition implies succession. Composition implies succession. Simplicity implies eternity. Composition implies succession. Simplicity implies eternity. If God is not a simple, pure, perfect being, but rather composed or composite, a combination of parts and pieces, then this implies a succession in God. It implies that there was a process of time that elapsed whereby those fundamental pieces came together into their composite form. Because when you get a Lego set, it does not arrive all put together, does it? And when you see it put together, what do you assume? There was a period of time where step one was followed, and then step two was followed, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until it was built, until all of the pieces had been composed and put together. And so if God is composed of, pe of parts or pieces, if God is composite and complex and not simple, this implies a succession in God, that there has been some process whereby those pieces came together into the form in which they are now. So if we deny the doctrine of divine simplicity, that God is pure, perfect being, and if we assert a, com a composition of some kind in God's being, we are stating that there is a succession in God, and we've just therefore compromised what? We've compromised the eternity of God. Simplicity implies eternity. And by eternity, I don't just mean start here and keep going on forever. I mean, you're not even on the line. <laughs> I don't just mean an everlastingness. I mean an, an existence independent of time, free from the limitations of time that we know as creatures. An existence that is independent from all succession and all time. That eternal now, that eternal today that Dr. Gallagher mentioned in the first lesson. And so simplicity says God is pure, perfect being, not made up of parts. There's no succession that caused him to be. He just exists as himself, simply, purely, and perfectly. God is not, God is, I am that I am. He's not, I am but by virtue of succession, I might be something different later. <laughs> I am, and I'm becoming. No, there's no sequence. There's no succession. There's no time for God by which he is finite and limited. But if he is composite, if God is put together of parts, there has been a succession. There's not only been a causation, that was the first argument, but there's also been a succession, a process by which causes put together these, this final form. And so if God is not caused by anything, as we said in the first point, if he is the sole explanation for his own existence, then there could never be any succession whereby something did cause God to be what he is. And so both aseity 
and eternity are protected only by divine simplicity. Aseity and eternity are protected only by divine simplicity. Otherwise, if we fail to hold to these fundamental truths, God is as much bound by time and causes as we are, which means he is not the God who he reveals himself to be and claims to be by his names. He is not I am that I am. He is I am because I was made this way. The third argument. Composition implies imperfection. Composition implies implies imperfection. Simplicity implies perfection. That which is put together of parts is imperfect. That which is what it is purely, perfectly, and simply, well, it is perfect. One of my least favorite things to do ever since my middle school days is to write rough drafts. I remember a biography I had to write on John Bunyan in fifth grade that my mom made me rewrite by hand. I think it was 100 times. No. I don't like rough drafts. I don't like redoing my work. Why? Because I'm lazy and proud. Okay? I don't like doing it and then redoing it. But why is it that we do rough drafts? Why is that the case? Well, it's because we, what we make is imperfect, and so we have to redo it in order to remove the imperfections and improve our drafts. Why is it that authors submit their manuscripts to editors? They know that there will be imperfections in their work, and it's the process of editing and redoing that eliminates those imperfections. And so, we only work on imperfect things. If it's perfect, you stop working on it. If you send a manuscript to an editor and it has no errors, which won't happen, they won't edit it. It's already good enough. It is what it is. It's good to go. We're not going to touch it. We won't change it. We'll publish it. Or you have an essay, well, you'll turn it in. It's ready to go. It's complete. It's finished. All things that have been assembled and put together imply imperfection. Why? Because those fundamental pieces in and of themselves were worked on and brought into a more complete form. But that complete form could be disassembled and reverted back into its more basic pieces or its previous forms. It hasn't yet arrived at that perfection of purity. Perhaps a more useful illustration in terms of how composition implies imperfection and simplicity implies perfection is to think about something like gold, where if you try to sell a lump of gold that's mixed with all sorts of other things, it will not be very valuable, and it must be, re must be heated and reduced and purified until it is, as much as we can make it, pure gold. And then the pure gold is incredibly valuable because all the other things, so long as it is composed of these multiple elements, it is not as valuable. It is not as useful, but rather pure gold is better than mixed gold. Or if you, if another way to think of it is heat itself as a fire is better than something heated up because the heat has heat in and of itself. The thing that's heated up only has heat by virtue of being heated up by the fire. So the fire is better than the thing that has been heated up. God, his being, is not caused. It is not caused in succession, and it is not imperfect. Rather, God is simple and pure and perfect. He is so simple, so pure, that there is no more perfect state that he could be reduced to. There's no impurity or imperfection whereby God could be worked on and brought into some greater form and more perfect form. He is God simply and purely. There's no pieces that may need to be removed or added or adjusted. He just is God, and he is God perfectly and purely, and therefore simply. If he is composed 
He is therefore imperfect. Any addition, if you, if you have a simple being, and of course it's, this sounds like playing with God and we know we're not doing that, but if you have a simple being, to add to that simple being, it's no longer simple. You've just added to it. Okay, you're making it better or you're making it worse. If you add to the simple being of God, are you going to make it better or worse? God cannot come into composition with any other thing. And remember, the hypostatic union, the union of the two persons, is not a composition. Our confessions make that clear. Not by composition or confusion. God is simple, pure, perfect being. He says, I am that I am. Not, I am, but I could be more. I am, and I am becoming. No, I am that I am. Simple, perfect being. No imperfection. Simplicity implies perfection. And so the aseity of God, the eternity of God, the purity of God, or the perfection of God, are all protected and guaranteed by asserting God's simplicity. All of which is in accordance with the divine names of God, the ways in which he has revealed himself to us in his word. Now we'll come to our fourth out of those five arguments about divine simplicity. Number four, composition implies creation. Simplicity implies creatorhood. Maybe you can think of a better word. Composition implies creation. Simplicity implies a creator or creatorhood. All created beings have been put together. Think of Adam. The body is created. The soul is breathed into Adam. You have the union of soul and body, and even the body is composed of many, 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 many parts. All things created are composed. All things created are put together. There's a variety of ways, a variety of kinds of composition in creation, and yet all creatures, all things, are composed. For God to be creator, therefore, he must not be composed. And this is really the same in many ways as the first point, which said God is not caused by anything. He is not created in any possible sense. But here we're approaching it specifically from the standpoint of creation. God has told us in his word that from him, through him, and to him are all things. He says, I've put everything together. I have made everything. And so if God has been put together, he has not put everything together. He's been put together. And so composition implies creation, whereas simplicity implies creatorhood. All things cannot be from him if he is from something else. God has given his creatures the capacity to create and build and conceptualize, etc. But even when we act in these ways, we don't have the power of true creation, of bringing from nothing. All we can do is rearrange the things that God has already created. Only God has created all things. We're not actually creating. We are making. We are rearranging. We are composing what God has called into being when we create things. God alone is the true creator, the one who has made all things and has the government over all things, the creator and sustainer of all creation. Why is this the case? Because he is simple. He is pure and perfect God. He has not been put together. Rather, he put all things together. So simplicity protects us being created, not that that necessarily needs protection in anyone's minds, but it more importantly protects God's creatorhood. God's creatorhood. Fifthly and finally under this point, number five, composition implies changeability. The ability to be changed. Composition implies changeability, simplicity implies immutability or unchangeability, if you like. Immutability. Dr. Gallagher said big words on a Friday night. Well, I apologize. We're going through all of them right now. 
Composition implies changeability. Simplicity implies immutability. Now, we've been making this point in all four of the previous ones. God is simple, pure, perfect being. Therefore, he's not caused. We've seen that. Therefore, there's no succession in him. We've seen that. Therefore, there's no imperfection in him. Therefore, there's no creation in him. He has not been created. If nothing can, God, can cause God to be, if nothing can happen to God or in God, if God is supremely and perfectly and infinitely perfect, and if God is the creator of all things, then what? God cannot change. He is immutable. Because all change supposes that either you will be improved to a better state or subtracted to a worse state. The change will either undo an imperfection in you or elevate you to a greater perfection or a degree of perfection, etc. Something like that. Not perfection, but goodness. So all changes are for the better or for the worse. That's a better way of putting it. If you try to change God, can you change him for the better? Can you make him more betterer? No. Can you improve God? Can you make him more perfect? Can you subtract from God? If God is simple, pure, perfect being, to subtract from God is God no longer exists. Because you can't, if you subtract from one, you get zero. If God is perfect, he cannot be changed. If God is uncaused, no succession, if he is eternal, if he is the creator, if he is perfect, then he cannot be changed, and nothing can act on God to cause him to change. Nothing can act upon God in a way that would then change his being into some new state. If God is simple, rather, without cause, without succession, without imperfection, then no perfection could be added to God that he does not already have. And no change could be effected in him in whom there is no succession of moments or collision of causes. Causes don't collide in God. Things don't happen to God. He is perfect, pure, and simple. And so as we contemplate God's immutability, we see again how simplicity and God's names go together so well. God is I am that I am, pure, perfect being, unchangeable, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Now, based on these five reasons, simplicity is the perfect and the necessary explanation for the perfection of God's being, which he has revealed to us in his names. And simplicity protects the aseity of God, the eternity of God, the purity of God, the creatorhood of God, and the immutability of God. Simplicity is very, very important, undergirding the doctrine of God. I'd like to conclude with a third and final point. The first point was the names of God. The second point, the simplicity of God. And this point is entitled, The Lord Our God. The Lord Our God. Throughout the Old Testament, you will see this phrase, The Lord Our God. And it's usually translating the Hebrew, Jehovah, Our Elohim. Jehovah, Our Elohim. The Lord Our God. And so it's in this point that I want to reinforce to you the importance the importance of what we have seen in this lesson today and will continue to see throughout this conference. Because a question might arise, and it, it often does, this kind of question frequently comes up, where people say, okay, what is the practical or personal value that these things have for me? What do these big words and these technical definitions and distinctions have to do with me, my messy house, and my chronic pain? The answer is in the title, The Lord, Our God. The Lord, Our God. I want you to take everything that we have learned about God 
And remember that we're not describing a specimen in a glass case that the little children should not touch because it's very precious. The Lord is our God. Jehovah is our God. I am that I am is our God, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the governor of all things. He who is exalted above all is our God. He is for us. And he is for us in Jesus Christ. He is our Father. He is our Heavenly Father. He is our God. He is the God of Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Joshua and David and Hezekiah and John and Peter and Paul. The God of Eve and Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Yael, Ruth, Naomi, Elizabeth, Mary, Martha. The God of you and you and you and you. Our God. Your God is simple. Your God is pure. Your God is absolute. Your God is perfect. What I'd like to do is to read to you a few quotes, which you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to read long quotes to people. And so I'm going to do this not so that I have no hope or or intent that you will remember all of the details of these quotes, I want you to feel the collective force of them, okay? So my expectation is not that we all remember all the words of the quotes, but feel the collective force of what these quotes will say, where they are going to take the doctrine of God and remind us of how important it is to remember that the Lord, our God, is our God. The first of these quotes comes from a man named John Preston. He said, If God be such a simple, first, pure and absolute being, if that, then what? Then hence you may see what a stable foundation our faith has to rest upon. We are built upon the lowest foundation in all the world, that is, upon the first, most absolute, and simple, and pure, and entire being, which I say is the lowest foundation that depends upon no other but all upon it. And this is the happy condition of all Christians and of them alone. You know what he means by the lowest foundation? If you think of a bridge, the bridge is held up by pillars. The pillars have bases rooted in in the ground beneath them. Those bases are sitting hopefully on stable ground beneath that. He's saying God is the lowest foundation who rests upon nothing, but all things rest upon him. That is only a sure and certain foundation if that foundation is a simple, pure, and perfect being. And that's why I said, if God be this way, then what a comfort we have. And indeed, that is who he is. I am that I am. The next quote is from Edward Lee. He said this, The attributes of God are everlasting, constant, and unchangeable. Forever in him, at one time as well as another. This may minister comfort to God's people. God's attributes are not changeable properties, but his very essence, his love and mercy are like himself, infinite, immutable, and eternal. He says this ministers comfort to God's people. Third of four quotes, a man with one of the best names ever in the world, Wolfgang Musculus. Almost as good as praise God bare bones. Wolfgang Musculus said this. He said, We do oftentimes perceive how inconstant and changeable any manner of good disposition of man's heart is. So we see goodness in us and we see how inconstant and changeable it is. He says, If you ask me the reason why are we so changeable, it may be answered that it is therefore unstable because it is not naturally grafted in us. It's not our nature to be that way, but bred by occasion and changeable causes. We are provoked or we are brought about to be good in those ways. He says, so that when the cause ceases, the effect also ceases. Something makes me happy, so I'm happy. 
and then something makes me angry, so I'm angry. The cause of my happiness has ceased, so my happiness ceases. The cause of my anger has entered, and so I'm angry. It says, the like, thinking that way, cannot be thought of the goodness of God. For God is good, not upon occasion or upon causes given by any other thing, but naturally of himself, and therefore look how unchangeable he in his nature is, and so unchangeable in his goodness also. Isn't that a wonderful comfort? That God is not loving because we cause him to be loving. God is love because God is love. Lastly, Benedict Pictet, or Pictet. He says this, There is no changeableness in God, not in his essence, for being the first, he cannot be superseded by any prior being. Being all-powerful, he cannot be injured by any. Being most simple, he can be corrupted by none. Being immense, he cannot be increased or lessened. Being eternal, he cannot fail. There is no change in his eternity. For where there is no succession, there is no mutation. Neither in his understanding, for the knowledge of God is all perfect. Nor in his will, for the will of God is all wise, to which nothing unforeseen can happen, so as to compel him to change his intentions for the better. Again, nothing can prevent and resist his will, though he does indeed will the various changes of things. This immutability of God is the foundation of our faith and hope. Brothers, the Lord our God is simple. Sisters, the Lord our God is simple. How many psalms call us to praise God based on the names of God and who he is? How many psalms say, oh, give thanks to the Lord, oh, praise the Lord, oh, praise Jehovah, for he is good. For his steadfast love lasts pretty long. For his steadfast love is more, more trustworthy than ours. For his steadfast love is, wow, it's pretty good in comparison to ours. For his steadfast love is what? Forever. He is not just good. He is goodness. The Lord, our God, tells us to think this way. In Malachi 3, 6, he says, I, the Lord, change not. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. And as others have pointed out, and I think they're right, sons of Jacob is not a very affectionate title. Sons of the deceiver, you wicked, treacherous, inconstant, unfaithful people, because I don't change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. And so remember, brothers and sisters, that when God promises in covenant that he will remember our sins no more, that the one making that promise is simple, is perfect, and is supreme. And if God puts our sins away from us, if God separates our sins from us in the blood of Jesus Christ and covenants with us forgiveness, then there is no power that can undo that. There is no creature that can corrupt it and no possibility that it can fail. I am that I am, says I will remember your sins no more. Not I am, but I might be something else tomorrow. I am that I am is the one who promises to be merciful toward our iniquities and to remember our sins no more. And so I encourage you to rest and rejoice in the simplicity of God. Because though it's true, we cannot fully comprehend God. We can truly apprehend God. We cannot know all there is about God, but we can know God. We may not be able to fit the ocean in a thimble, to fit God in our minds, but if we are content with that thimble, we will find that it is still a pool deeper than we could ever fathom. And it is a wellspring of comfort and hope. It is a thimble that gives and gives and gives, and then we realize it's our brains that are the thimble, not what God has revealed to us. And yet a thimbleful is enough for us. A telescope may only see a portion at a time, but with each glance, with each gaze, 
one sees more and more and wonders more and more. In other words, is amazed more and more. And so the more we contemplate God, his perfection, his purity, with something like divine simplicity, the more we have reason to praise him, the more we have reason to trust him, the more we have reason to serve him, who is I am that I am, Jehovah, Yah, El, Eloah, Elohim, Adonai, Shaddai, the Lord of hosts, the Most High. Let's close in prayer. Oh Lord, our God, how we thank you that you have made yourself known to us. How we thank you that you have revealed to us your name, your works, your perfection, your purity. We pray that you would cause us from these things to be humbled, that we might remove our sandals, so to speak, that we might bow before you in praise and worship, that we might see that we are creatures, and yet that we might find such dear comfort in knowing that you are not a creature, that you are God, that you are our creator, you are our sustainer, you are our redeemer. How we thank you that your covenant promises to us are guaranteed, they're stabilized, they're undergirded, they are made sure by who you are. There's no one greater by whom you can swear than yourself. And so we rely, we trust, we rest in your promises. Oh Lord, our God, help us. Please forgive us for our unbelief. Forgive us for our fears. Forgive us for not trusting. And please help us to set our eyes upon you as you have revealed yourself to us, to praise you, to serve you, to trust you all our days, knowing that because you do not change, therefore we are not consumed. How we praise you and thank you, O God, our Father, O God, the Son, and O God, the Holy Spirit, our triune, perfect, simple God. And so to you, our Father, we pray, by the Holy Spirit, and in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.